Good morning and uh, welcome to this week's Monday Market Webinar with me, Michael Hewson, in the absence of David Madden, who's on holiday this week. And it's the 26th of March, it's the last week of the third month, so we're coming to the end of the quarter as well. So the end of the end of the week, end, sorry, end of the month and end of the quarter. And um, given the declines that we've seen at the end of last week, it's quite likely that we could well see um, a negative quarter for the S&P 500, and it will be the first negative quarter for the S&P 500 since 2015. So that's quite a significant run of um, positive uh, quarters that's finally coming to an end. It's also likely to be the second negative month in a row. Um, so I think the big question I think um, that um, most people are wrestling with at the moment, certainly I'm trying to figure out whether or not the declines of the past couple of weeks are likely to prompt a rebound in the same way that they did in February when we found a bit of a base, or whether or not um, we are on the cusp of potentially further equity market declines. Obviously, once I've got the disclaimers out of the way, um, I can get started on the actual analysis and look at the key chart points. And also, I think the key events that I'll be keeping a BDI out for this week. So we're going to start um, with the Nikkei 225, because even though we broke below the February lows, we've seen a decent rebound. And I think when we looked at the end of last week, there was a, I think there was quite a decent chance that we're expecting a significantly lower open here in Europe today. The fact that that didn't happen, I think, is largely down to the fact of an interview that Treasury Secretary, U.S. Treasury Secretary Stephen Mnuchin gave to Fox News on Sunday. And I think, you know, when, when you actually look at the overall negativity surrounding the declines that we saw on Friday, I think there was a big concern that um, the ramped up rhetoric from the Trump administration with respect to tariffs on Chinese products, particularly 25% um, um, tariffs on $60 billion of Chinese industrial exports in retaliation for allegedly forcing foreign companies to transfer technology and other intellectual property um, was I think there was a concern that we would see significant blowback from China on those tariffs. Their response was fairly nuanced and fairly restrained. And I think that did give some confidence that maybe this was potentially a negotiating strategy. And certainly I think some of the comments that we've seen uh, coming out from not only US Treasury Secretary Mnuchin, that he was cautiously optimistic that there would be he would be able to come to an agreement with his Chinese counterpart, who is the Chinese Vice Premier Liu He. He's President Xi Jinping's most trusted economic advisor. That um, there could be a mechanism whereby the the Chinese surplus with the U.S. of 375 billion dollars, which President Trump is keen to get down by around $100 billion, there is some optimism that there could be some progress on this over the course of the next few days. And that's really, I think, why we've seen the rebound in the Nikkei. Um, but more broadly, I think the rebound in European markets in general. South Korea also gained an exemption to the Trump tariffs becoming the latest in a long line of US counterparties that had gained an exemption on the back of the EU, who gained an exemption at the end of last week. So I think concerns about an escalation have diminished, and I think that's why you're seeing a little bit of a rebound in equity markets in general. But that doesn't really, I think, draw a line under the subject, because ultimately there's still an awful lot of concern, I think, about what's going on in the tech sector. I think if we look at the tech sector, the way that has um, behaved over the course of the past few months and years, the tech sector has driven a good proportion of the rebound in the S&P 500 and equity markets in general over the course.
course of the past two years. And obviously these concerns with respect to Facebook, um, the um, deterioration and sentiment around that particular um, stock, further regulatory um, oversight there could well impact on some of the some of the some of the uh, rally that we've seen in that particular stock. And I'll be looking at Facebook stock as well, and the fact that that's declined quite significantly over the course of the past two to three days, and actually could be on the cusp of further declines going forward. So we'll be looking at that. We'll be looking at the broader tech sector in general. Um, but before before we get to that, let's look at some of the key chart points on the major ben benchmarks. So at the moment, with respect to the Nikkei, we've seen a decent rebound on that today. Um, I think the next resistance level on this particular one is around about 21,000, 20,960. Um, we have broken below the 200-day moving average, and I think that is significant because ultimately, when we look at across, when we cross, when we look at across the index um, spectrum, the only indices that haven't as yet crossed below their 200-day moving averages are the U.S. ones. So I think the U.S. markets are the last line of defence when it comes to further declines in equity markets in general. And we can really see that no better illustrated by what we're seeing in the S&P 500. And I talked about it a little bit this morning when I did my daily Periscope update, which I try and do between 8 o'clock and 9 o'clock in the morning. And we can look at the 200-day moving average and we can see the significance of that particular um, support level by the way that we we saw a significant rebound off those off off that level in February, we've retested it on Friday. We've rebounded from it today, and the likelihood is we're going to see a very positive uh, U.S. open when U.S. markets open in just over two hours' time. For me, I think to see a significant stabilisation and sentiment for U.S. markets is we really need to see a move back above 2670, which coincides with the peak on Friday, but also this series of lows that we saw through here at the beginning of March. Now, going back to a slightly longer term chart on the S&P 500, we can see how well this particular index has done over the course of the past few quarters. As we can see here, we've seen a very, very strong run of gains. The likelihood is we're going to see a negative quarter for the first time since the middle of 2015. If we look at it on a monthly basis over the last five years, again, we're on course for the second successive monthly decline, the first time that we've seen a significant um, consecutive session of monthly declines pretty much since the middle of 2016, but again, those were, those were fairly modest. I think we'd have to go back to 2015 to really see um, significant declines in the S&P 500 for quite some time. So, you know, look at, looking at the longer term picture, I think there is a significant change in sentiment. We can see that here on the actual um, index there, which is borne out obviously by this particular chart here. And it's a similar sort of story on the, on the US 30 as well, though I'm a little bit reluctant to sort of really take much of an indicator from that there simply because of how far away the 200 day moving average is relative to the S&P and given how heavily skewed the, the Dow is relative to the overall benchmarks. What we've also seen here today is once again a rebound on the German DAX. We managed to hold above those 2000, those, Feb, those February lows that we saw and the March lows as well and again we've seen a significant rebound. So at the moment I think it's the S&P and the DAX that are um, really putting a floor under equity markets for the time being. With respect to the DAX, what I would hope to see is a recovery back through 12,000 to signal a little bit of a stabilization. But overall, I think there is a warning sign here. We have seen a strong move lower, a rebound, a strong move lower, a rebound, and then a strong move lower. So every single rebound has been slightly below the previous one, which suggests to me that there is reducing or declining confidence in the sustainability 
of the equity market rally that we're seeing at the moment. We are starting to get a little bit sticky in the overall um, in the overall, I think, confidence of where equity markets can go to next. And does that mean that we're going to start to roll off a cliff? You know, I'm very reluctant to sort of start basically lobbing those sorts of adjectives around. But certainly in terms of the rolling over of the 50 and the 200 day moving average, not only on the DAX, but also on the broader indices in terms of the 50 day moving average, momentum is now starting to favour the bears relative to the bulls. So while you may hear a whole raft of people going, you know, making the positive case for stock markets, what we've seen over the past two to three months would appear to suggest that we're, it's going to be a long haul back to suggest that we're going to see a really strong rally in the short to medium term. I think if anything, it's going to be a, sl a long, slow grind higher. And earlier this year, I suggested that we may well have seen the highs for the year I still stand by that. I still think there's a distinct possibility that we're likely to continue to be in a sell the rally type mindset over the course of the next few trading sessions. Certainly what we're seeing here with respect to the FTSE 100, that does appear to be fairly positive. But what I would look to see here, I think, is a consolidated move above the highs that we saw on Friday. So essentially what I'm looking for is for us to close well above 69.60 to suggest that we're going to get a retest of the 7,000 level and the 7,000 and get a move to around about 7,020. We do appear to be looking a little bit overbought and oversold rather. What am I saying? We are looking a little bit oversold, which would appear to suggest that we are due a little bit of a rebound. So I think as we head in towards the end of the quarter and the end of the month, I think there is scope for a little bit of profit taking and ultimately I would expect the 200 day moving average to hold in the short to medium term on the S&P and that in all likelihood is likely to prompt a little bit of consolidation and a little bit of a rebound over the course of the next few days. Um, we've also got a host of key Fed speakers scheduled to hold forth on monetary policy over the course of the next few days. Now that the Fed meeting is safely out of the way, I still think that the likelihood is that the Fed is going to, or Fed speakers, we've got Dudley, Mester, Randall Quiles and Bostic, who are all fairly, I think, likely to remain fairly positive on the case for further US rate rises over the course of the next few months. Now, if we look at the possibility of a June rate rise that still remains fairly positive I think with an 80% probability we can see that here WIRP on the Bloomberg there's an 80.9% possibility of a Federal Reserve rate rise in June so the case still remains for a rate rise in June which would be two I'm still not convinced of the case for four despite what you may hear from a number of eminent commentators. I think that still remains a fairly tall order. I think much will depend on the inflation data that we've got coming out of the US, and we'll get some indication on that later this week. If we look at the market calendar, we can look at some of the key events that I'll be keeping a close eye out for later this week. And the main event that I will be keeping a very close eye on is not so much the GDP numbers which are due out on Wednesday. We're expecting a slight improvement to fourth quarter of GDP to 2.7. If we look at quarterly inflation that's expected to tick higher from 1.3 to 1.9 but it's really the monthly PCE numbers that I'll be paying particular attention to and these are out on the 29th and it's this number here, the PCE core price index, and that's currently at 1.5%. And as we all know, the Fed target is for 2%. This is the Fed's um, preferred measure for inflation, and we're expecting a modest improvement to 1.59%, around about 1.6%. So, again, by the Fed's preferred measure of inflation, 
it's still it's still fairly subdued, despite the fact that ISM surveys, prices paid surveys, continue to show um, price pressure at multi-year highs. What's also important, I think, in the context of this particular debate is personal income and personal spending. Um, one of the things that I've been a little bit concerned about is the fact that US retail sales have continued to remain fairly weak over the last two to three months, despite fairly high consumer confidence levels. You know, and there's a, there's a significant divergence there between the two, which don't, to my mind, make an awful lot of sense. So if we look at personal consumption, that still remains fairly weak, 0.2. Personal income, 0.4. So spending patterns still remain fairly subdued. Retail sales remain fairly subdued, despite the fact that the US consumer is 70% of the US economy. So that suggests to me that ultimately, while the US consumer is telling us one thing, there is a concern if the Fed hikes rates too aggressively, that could tip the US economy, particularly in the consumer on the consumer side. Um, it could curtail retail sales spending even further. And I think that's something that while Fed policymakers may not acknowledge it now, they may have to acknowledge it further down the line. So what does this mean for the potential for further dollar weakness? Because certainly I think in terms of where the dollar index has been, we're not really getting any significant clues as to where the US dollar is going to go to next. And that's really borne out by this chart that I'm showing you here. Regular viewers will know that I've been watching this dollar index chart for quite some time. We still remain in this sideways channel that we've been in since those early February and those early January lows. We haven't really broken out of that, despite the fact that dollar yen has broken lower. Euro dollar is still in its broad range that it's been in for the past three to six months. And the likelihood is that it's likely to remain in that range. We, I think, you know, with respect to currencies, I've been very, very surprised how, how, how benign they've been. And ultimately, the only thing that has really changed is the fact that dollar yen's broken below 105.20, which suggests to me that if we do get a stronger yen, that's likely to change the dynamics with respect to how markets are perceiving risk, given the fact that the yen generally tends to be perceived as a safe haven currency. So let's look at the currency. Let's look at the currency picture because ultimately, what I've seen here is on a on a technical basis, the break below 105.50, 105.40.50, has potentially negative connotations for the dollar yen, which would suggest to me that I think the bias has shifted ever so slightly towards dollar yen heading back to 104.30 initially. And that should act as support that 2030 level. But unless we can get back above 105.50 here, and let me draw that in for you, this particular level, as well as the cloud resistance, the Ichimoku cloud, which has basically pushed and weighed on this move lower, while we remain below this level here, then ultimately dollar yen remains very much a sell the rally type of trade. Um, so Looking, I think, on the four hourly chart, we can see that we're starting to turn higher. So I think there's a good chance we could get a move back to around about 105.20.30, 105.40. But it's going to, I think it's going to be very, very difficult for dollar yen to move significantly above that in the short to medium term. So looking at the overall picture for dollar yen, very much a sell the rally type of trade while we're below 105.50. Looking at the pound against the dollar, we're looking at for potentially further sterling strength, but, and there's a significant caveat to this particular trade here, we are running into a huge area of resistance on the pound against the dollar. Um, and I've talked about this previously as well, this 200 week moving average, which currently comes in round about where we are now, actually, we're at between 142.30 and 142.50. So I think if we're going to see further gains in cable, then we really need to close above this 200 week moving average to really start to push on towards 145 and 146. I still remain fairly constructive on the pound, 
but at these sorts of levels, I think you have to be overly cautious about being aggressively long. I think at the moment, the momentum is higher. We are looking a little bit overbought on the short term, and that would suggest to me that we could well drift back down to around about 141 while we're below this trend line resistance here. So we could go back to 142.30, 142.40 in the short to medium term, but I think it's really going to struggle for momentum anywhere near 143 in the short term. What could change that, however, is how Euro Sterling behaves over the course of the next few sessions. And that does appear to be showing some signs of rolling over. But again, here we're in a range. And I always think it's very dangerous if you're looking to sell breaks when you're looking at Euro Sterling in this sort of prism, because around about 86.90, 87, over the course of the past six months, there's been a steady stream of buyers for Euro Sterling. So it's going to be unlikely that you're going to get an aggressive move lower unless we really do take out the June lows that we saw last year at around about 86.50. Um, if we look at the number of times we've come down here and found buyers, there's, there's quite a few. And that would suggest that it's likely that this trend will continue. We'll get buyers around here and we'll get sellers anywhere towards 87.50, 87.60, and maybe 88. But ultimately, I think, looking at this chart here, it's very much a range trade until such times as there's any evidence to the contrary. Same sort of thing applies to Euro-Dollar. Again, we've got a very, very big resistance level above 125. We've seen a decent rebound off the 122.5 level here. We can see that through here as well by the distribution of these candle charts or these, 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 these lows through here, there, and there, and there. It had a little bit of a break below there, but ultimately it wasn't sustained. Uh, we're starting to look a little bit overbought on the four, the four hour chart around about 124.20, 124.30, which would suggest to me there's a little bit of resistance anywhere through here. But even if we do get through there, we've also got 124.30 on the top side. So again, I think um, looking at this, it's very much a range trade on the overall euro dollar. And even if we do break through 124.20, 124.30, we've got a big area of resistance above 125. And that's even before we start to even think about the 61.8 Fibonacci retracement level from the 2014 highs to the lows that we saw earlier this year. Ultimately, it's very difficult to argue for a breakout of the range, given what we're seeing with respect to the macro picture. You'd need a significant catalyst to suggest that we're going to move higher. I don't think at the moment there's any appetite for that to happen. And the, the news flow doesn't appear to suggest that. And as we come up to Easter, I think the, I think the appetite for any significant new aggressive positioning is likely to be fairly diminished as we head in towards the end of the week. And I think that's something that we all have to bear in mind as Easter comes out. I think it's very it's going to be very difficult for anyone to take on any new aggressive posture ahead of a long weekend as well, and that needs to be borne in mind as well. Let's look at dollar CAD because that's showing some significant that's showing some interesting patterns as well. We've seen potential. For a little bit of a topping pattern here. Is this the beginnings of a head and shoulders formation? It's certainly looking very interesting. We could get a rebound back to around about 130, but there does appear to be some evidence that we could be starting to potentially top out on dollar CAD and head a little bit lower on a break of this neckline support that I've drawn in here. Um, what else do we need to look at? I think the US Treasury is quite an interesting chart as well. Keep an eye on that. 279.80, a big area of support through there. We've got a slight rebound in yields off that level there, um, which at the moment is helping support dollar yen push higher. Um, so don't, there, there, there tends to be a decent correlation between those two. Keep an eye, keep an eye on that. Um, we've looked at the Germany 30. We've looked at the Nikkei 225. We've looked at the FTSE 100. Please feel free to, to ask, ask any questions if there's anything that I've missed out. Let's have a quick look at gold. I'll come on to Facebook in a minute because that's actually an interesting chart and actually could well 
suggest that we could be on course for further declines there. Um, but looking looking at the gold price, we're looking to approach resistance from the 2018 highs, currently around about 1350, 1355. Um, we can see that drawn in through there. If we just yeah, 1355 there or thereabouts on the current daily chart. So that's coming into a key resistance level there. And Brent crude. We saw a really decent rebound in Brent and WTI last week. But what was notable was we weren't able to take out the previous highs from earlier this year in January. And I think that's significant. Um, I think the inability to take out those highs does appear to suggest that even though we have seen a slight change in sentiment with respect to crude prices, it's going to be very difficult in the short to medium term to suggest that we could get um, a move significantly higher. So one of the reasons why we got that spike higher last week was that Saudi Arabia might look to extend the production cap into 2019. We've also seen the appointment of John Bolton as National Security Advisor. Now he's a renowned hawk on Iran. And that's raised concerns that the US might look to pull out of the nuclear deal, which would pave the way to blocking Iran's ability to explore, export to the global oil market. Now that's really significant because Iran is OPEC's third biggest exporter behind Saudi Arabia and Iraq. At the moment, in the short term, I don't think there's any likelihood of the US pulling out of the Iran nuclear deal, but it, I would expect to hear more chatter on that once John Bolton takes his place as National Security Advisor at the beginning of April. He doesn't take up his position until the 9th of April. So that could be a story for next month. In the short term, I don't think it's a story for this month. And given how close we are to very key resistance level on crude oil, it's 50% of the pullback of the decline from the 2014 highs to the lows that we saw beginning of 2016. That 71.65 is going to be a tough nut to crack on Brent crude. On WTI, it's a similar sort of story. Again, a very key resistance level, but also um, below the 2018, the, the January 2018 peaks that we saw earlier around about $67 a barrel, $66.80, $67 a barrel. So to wrap up, Let's have a quick look at this Facebook um, chart, which I posted on the chart forums last week. It's a very significant break below um, what could be a potential reversal pattern. It's a very messy, I would, I would grant you that, it's a very messy head and shoulders breakout. But I think now that we've broken below 170, then I think there's certainly potential for us to head back to around about 142. What I've done with this is I've taken the peak here and measured it from the break below this horizontal support and resistance line here. We haven't as yet been able to get back above it. We're also below the 200 day moving average, which would suggest that if we do get a rebound in Facebook shares to around about 165, as long as we stay below this resistance level, this previous support level, which is now resistance level, then we could well see a move back to 152 and potentially 142, which is our minimum price objective for this move and this break lower here. So certainly in the context of while we're below 170, then Facebook could well head back towards 142 on a measured move basis on this breakout, breakout below here. And if Facebook um, moves lower, then I think there's a good chance we could see um, further tech shares come under set, come under pressure as well. Looking at Apple, that's currently on support at around about 164, 165, there or thereabouts. So keep an eye on where we open there. We're also on the 200-day moving average for Apple. So that's going to be an interesting little move. And if we look at Alphabet as well, Google, by any other name, that's also coming in. Uh, close to its 200 day moving average, as well as obviously looking at this horizontal line here through here. Tech stocks in particular, I think, are going to be, um, I'm going to be keeping a close eye on these various levels 
on Alphabet, on Facebook and on Apple over the course of the next few trading sessions because they could offer significant clues as to where the NASDAQ could go to next. Okay, so um, it's 12.45. Um, unless anyone has any further questions or wants me to look at anything that I may have missed out on, um, I'd like to thank you all for tuning in. And um, if you have any questions in the interim between now and Friday, you can always find me on Twitter at mhewson underscore cmc. Otherwise, I'd like to thank you all for tuning in today. And if I don't speak to you beforehand, have a great Easter and speak to you all in two weeks' time. We'll be back in two weeks' time. There'll be no Monday Market Webinar on Monday, next Monday, because it's Easter Monday. And we'll rejoin on Monday, I think, the 9th of April. Thanks very much and um, have a successful trading week.